be a sponge, and then bring the juice. By focusing on your improvement, by focusing on your progress, and eliminating any fixed mindset that you may have, and acts of perfectionism, then you encourage your own mastery. On some level, we do what we want to do 24 hours a day. Now, sometimes it may not seem like that, like, but if I'm choosing to work instead of sleep, what I'm actually saying is, keeping my job is more important than sleeping. I'm tired of this. Like, it's just like, I'm tired of getting beat. What can I do to, to get over this hump? So mentally, that's when I kind of put that, that forefront, like, hey, it's either all or nothing. I, I, I like to put failure in quotations because I don't believe that failure is true failure if you're looking at it with the right mindset. The truth is the journey to greatness is hard. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes focus, and every day you have to decide what you value, what you want to pursue, and what you want to achieve. And if you dig deep enough, if you push hard enough, we all have what it takes to be great. Welcome to the Edge of Greatness. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Edge of Greatness podcast. I'm your host, Charles Schultz, and today I'm joined by a very special guest, professional learner and the founder of the Learner Lab, Trevor Reagan. Thank you so much for joining me today, Trevor. Thank you. I'm excited to get this started. Me too. I, I'm, I think learning is such a special skill and a special thing to learn to do better. That's weird that I use learning and learn together at the same time. <laughs> but tell me, what sparked your initial interest in becoming a learner? So... I guess it's easy to kind of look backwards and act like, oh, I knew what I was doing all along and this is a brilliant business. That's not the case. Uh, I kind of stumbled into it. I, I would say maybe one of the biggest reasons I got into this was I had a big goal when I was younger and I almost achieved it, but I fell short and that like ruined me. <laughs> and it, it wasn't like the classic ESPN 30 for 30, like then I doubled down and achieved it. It's like, no, that like put me into a tailspin for years. But looking back, I see that that failure sort of planted a seed in my head of like, wow, what could I have done better to maybe make it over the hump? And I think that seed created a bit of curiosity around like the, the learning research. And so I credit that. And then there's all sorts of other things like, uh, both my parents were coaches. So I was like very involved in the sports world. And I think when you're around sports, you're, you're always kind of curious about learning and development. And so all of these things came together to sort of put me on this path, but it's been a windy road. It's like, when I started this, it was mostly just basketball focused. Then it became more just sports in general. And then after years of trial and error, I get to the point of like, oh, actually what you're trying to get good at is learning. And you can make a strong argument that that's the best thing to get good at because it's relevant to anyone, anywhere, it doesn't matter the context we're in. If you're like good at getting good, that's useful. And so that was like perhaps the biggest pivot I made in my content and in my learning is just connecting the dots of like, what are we actually trying to get good at? We're trying to get good at learning. And then my goal is like, okay, well, what are the building blocks of that? Like, how do you become a better learner? And that's where I spend my time. See, I think a lot of people, when they hear the word learner, they think of just like knowledge acquisition and not necessarily learning across skills, across yeah. different platforms. So can you tell me when you think of the word learn, what does that mean to you? So Anders Ericsson, unfortunately he passed away, but he's one of the most brilliant people in the learning world. There's some controversy around his work because there's a lot of misunderstandings around his work, but he taught me when I interviewed him, he's like, there's a difference between knowledge and skill. It's like knowledge you can acquire passively. You can read, you can listen, you can observe. And that knowledge is essential. You're basically learning, how do I do this thing? And that's, yeah, of course you need that. But then he's like, the skill requires action. So it's like, yeah, you could read all sorts of books about a particular topic. I could read books about how to become like a better communicator or storyteller but nothing actually changes unless I go practice the skill of storytelling and communication. So put the knowledge into practice. And so I think 
the same rules apply to just looking at learning as a whole. It's like, no, we're trying to get better at stuff. I'm not just trying to know more about something. Now that is a piece. And so it gets kind of messy and complicated, but what I'm trying to really push and what I'm trying to help people with, like the groups that we work with is we want to stack more skills. Um, we're not necessarily telling people what skills they need to learn because they have a much better idea of that than me, but it's like, I'm going to help you create a foundation that you can build on top of and acquire the skills that matter to you. I've heard you mention a few times that a lot of people understand fear, understand learning, understand growth mindsets, but the biggest gap is that few know how to apply that knowledge. Is that kind of what you're talking about here is the application of the learning? Yeah. And I think all these traps and, and misunderstandings and misconceptions, I talk about them because I fell into them. It's like, yeah, I like I messed this up for years. And and I think one big one is people like me, we're talking about a, a specific topic or tool, but we don't provide the like context of why this tool matters. And so I used to do this. Like I look at my old content and it's like, this is interesting. This is interesting. This is interesting. This is interesting. But there's no overarching theme. But the way we talk about it now is our overarching theme is we want to be good at learning. Okay. This is why a growth mindset matters. It helps you in this pursuit of better learning. Uh, we want to be good at learning. What does learning require? Trial and error and practice and action that involves some struggle and discomfort. Okay. I need to be good at dealing with discomfort because that will help me get better at learning. And so you see, we're showing like the use case of the tool, not just explaining a bunch of tools. And that's been really important for me is just like suss out these different topics, but explain not only what the topic is, but why that tool matters in the bigger picture of learning. You mentioned learning takes place in the discomfort areas and the, un and the unknown and the struggle. How do we help people venture more into that realm? Because I think a lot of people <laughs> like being comfortable they like staying yeah. in that that warm place where i know my blanket <laughs> is and i can sit by my fire I... yeah and and there's nothing wrong with comfort and so like that's something i want to clear up i'm not saying you have to spend your whole life out of your comfort zone like of course not it's saying if you want to get better at something you need to stretch out a little bit now i would say how do we help people do that let's go through three different things we could do one is by reminding people of the importance of the struggle, they're more likely to do it. And that seems simple, but it's absolutely true because that's what exercise is. It's like at its core, working out is struggling on purpose. Like that's what it is. It's like, we know, oh, to get stronger, I have to challenge my body. So I run farther, run faster. I add weights, I switch up my routine. All of that is different ways of inducing struggle to get stronger. Now, we know that when you're working out, yeah, it like it feels good. But if I'm doing a set or like if I'm doing 12 reps of an exercise, the eight through 12 doesn't necessarily feel great, but I do it. Why do I do it? Because I know the eight through 12s when I'm like really challenged and struggling, I know that there's value in that struggle. And so I'm more likely to do it. Learning can be the same. So if we remind people of the value of the struggle, the importance of the struggle, we're not just struggling for the fun of it. We're struggling because that leads to growth. So whether I'm trying to grow a muscle or a skill, same rules apply. I have to stretch out of the comfort zone a bit and create that challenge, create that struggle. And that's where I learn the best. So I think uh, approach number one is to remind people of the value of the struggle that can help. I think the other, the other approach is to go deeper and just ask the question and kind of work backwards logically. It's like, okay, you're telling me I have to struggle to grow. I have to make mistakes. I have to practice something quite a bit. I have to stretch out of my comfort zone. Why do you think we avoid doing stuff like that? And you nailed perhaps the biggest. It's like, it doesn't feel good. And we, <laughs> we're like, we're, we're designed to seek comfort. And that's where like one of our most like famous topics that we talk about on the website. Um, and I did a TEDx talk about this is just like, helping people change the way they think about discomfort can help a ton in the learning process. And it's common in society. If you like looked on LinkedIn and Twitter, 
a lot of people mean well when they talk about discomfort and fear and stress. And we tell you like, don't worry, uh, calm down, be fearless. You got to be fearless to go learn. And it's like kind of what they're saying is right. It's like, we don't want fear to get in the way of learning, but the strategy is flawed. Because if you look into the research around our emotions and around discomfort and around fear and stress, anxiety and nerves, you see, you can't just turn those things off. <laughs> so it's like, you're telling me to be fearless, but if I'm in a situation where I'm being stretched out of my comfort zone, if I'm in a situation that involves some uncertainty, if I care about this thing that's happening, I'm going to feel some stuff. And the problem is you tell me to be fearless. And now I'm sitting in the lobby before a job interview and I'm nervous and I go, Oh crap, I'm supposed to be fearless, but I'm nervous. What does that mean? That means I'm doing something wrong. I must not be prepared. Maybe I'm not good enough for this job. And you see like, all of these like ideas spring up because I'm working under this flawed assumption that if I was prepared, if I did, be did belong here, I wouldn't be nervous. And the amazing thing is if you can just flip that script a little bit and help people understand that like, yo, feeling the nerves doesn't necessarily hurt your performance misinterpreting the nerves hurts your performance. And so when we give people permission to be nervous and help them understand, yo, this is okay. This is human. It's like, again, logically it's called a comfort zone for a reason. So if you're out of the comfort zone, it's not comfortable. And when I help people reinterpret that, it helps them deal with it. So now if I'm nervous before a presentation, I get really nervous before my talks and I've done thousands of them, but I still get nervous. In my past, I would interpret the nerves as weakness. Oh, I'm, I must not have practiced enough or I, I, I'm not smart enough to do this. The imposter syndrome versus now is I'm nervous because I care how this goes, because there's people watching me, because there's uncertainty. I don't know how this is going to go. I'm nervous because I'm stretched out of my comfort zone. And it's not necessarily because I didn't practice enough. And so the same feeling, but do you see the way I interpret the feeling is going to help me deal with it. And so that's one of the most important tools I think that can help people in the learning process. Yeah. So in my experience as a coach, and then actually in a few conversations that I've recently had, it's been brought up that high school kids, especially athletes, their greatest fear is failure. So they have this fear of not doing well, and they yep. have this fear of failing in front of their friends and, and struggling and not doing their job, but we can't eliminate the fear as you just mentioned. So how do we go about being better at handling when those fearful moments happen? I think two step process. Step one is get very clear as, so as leaders, we need to give them the permission and normalize the discomfort and say, look, when you do things that stretch you, when you do things that involve failure or mistakes, it creates discomfort. And that doesn't mean you're on the wrong path. That just means you're a human. Like that's a part of your brain doing what it's designed to do. And so step one is reminding them of that. Like there's studies. Uh, I kind of hit the lotto with this topic, to be honest. I got to interview maybe five of the best researchers in this field. And they look at it from different perspectives. But there's this researcher named Jeremy Jameson. And he told me about a couple of studies that I think really paint the picture here. So one, they did it at Harvard and they just have two groups of students. And one group is given the practice GRE exam with no special instructions. And the second group is given the same exam, but then they're given like one paragraph of instructions on top. And this paragraph basically says what you and I just said, Hey, when you take an exam like this, it's normal to be nervous. It's normal to feel some nerves here. Uh, that's human. That's expected. More times than not, it's a sign that you care. It's your body getting ready for the challenge. So they're kind of normalizing it, giving them permission to be nervous. So the first group scores like a 684 out of 800, I think it is. And the second group scores a 739 out of 800. And that's a decent bump in performance. Three months later, those students take the real GRE and they report their scores back and a similar gap remained. So this was one study, one day, one paragraph, and the students who read the paragraph do better three months later on the real GRE than the students that didn't. Now, that was one paragraph. That wasn't like a, 
60 minute lecture on why we feel uncomfortable. It was basically just helping them understand, yo, this is okay. And so I think that's pretty compelling. He told me about a study, it's not published yet, but it's coming out soon where they did sort of an intervention like this with college students, like going into their first year of college. The group that's taught about, like taught this material, two years later, they're doing better in their classes than the students that didn't. The students that are taught this material tend to take more difficult classes. Why? Because they know, oh, just because this class makes me feel a bit uncomfortable doesn't mean I can't deal with it. Versus maybe our old school approach to discomfort is, well, if this makes me feel weird, I better not do it. And so again, it's like, we take the power back from our emotions, not by fighting them and suppressing them, but by increasing our understanding of them, why we feel them. And when we do that, we get a bit better at dealing with them. So with all of your experience now working with fear and understanding how it works, do you still struggle with fear itself? 100%. Like we all do. And I guess <laughs> it's funny because uh, two minutes ago for the people listening, I was like, this is a two part answer. And then I only gave you one part. But the second part is, is like belongs here, which is once we give ourselves permission to feel it and understand it, we practice the skill of feeling uncomfortable and then doing the thing. And so I tell people, just like any skill, you can start small and building it. So like if I'm doing a workshop with a group and we, we talk about the fear piece, I, I straight up say, it's like, now I'm not saying go home tonight and pick the thing that freaks you out the most and do it tomorrow. But if you treat this as a skill and say, okay, I want to get some reps around it. Maybe it's, I feel kind of weird, but I ask the question anyways, I feel kind of weird but I have the tough conversation. I kind of, I feel kind of weird, but I volunteer for this project out of the comfort zone. I feel kind of weird, but I try out for the team. And as I get these reps of feeling, doing, feeling, doing, I get a little bit better at the skill. Doesn't mean I'm perfect with it. It's like, I've been obsessed with this topic for seven years. And of course, fear beats me all the time. But because I'm aware of the system, I win more battles than I would if I was not aware of the system. And that's what we're, what, what we're all chasing, not perfection, but we just want to win a few more battles than we would have. So is it fair to like make the analogy of like, since I work in a weight room, I work with a lot of kids. If we're trying to get stronger in squat, we're going to build that resistance over time. And so we're not necessarily eliminating that, that fear, which is yep. eventually going to find it, but we're just pushing how much more weight we can get before the fear hits in. Yep. So we're trying to stretch that you're, and you're, and you're building up to it. So okay. it's like, I don't go from squatting the bar to squat squatting like 225. It's like, I build up to that little by little. And the same is true with this. It's like, if I have a huge fear of public speaking, I'm probably not going to give a Ted talk tomorrow, but I can stack up some reps in that direction and get better at this skill by understanding my fear and understanding that if I'm in a learning situation, Feeling uncomfortable does not necessarily mean I'm doing something wrong. It's just like part of who I am. This is part of being human. I, I heard you mention during your TED talk that you had a conversation with Seth Godin and that totally changed the way you looked at fear. How did you initially approach fear? Like everyone did, which is if I'm feeling this, I'm doing something wrong and then falling down the slippery slope of all the suboptimal strategies of getting rid of the feeling. <laughs> and so that's how everyone, that's how most people approach it. And so he was one of the first to get me on the path of, yes, we do want to take the power away from our emotions. We don't want our emotions driving our behavior, but the catch 22 is you take the power back from the emotions, not by getting rid of them or denying them, because that's a losing battle. You take the power back by understanding and accepting. And so he's the one that got me started on this path. But Seth Godin's not a researcher. He's a brilliant thinker. And what I've made my mission, like a big part of my mission is I want to find the science. And so I take this topic. He basically teaches me everything that we just talked about. But then I was like, okay, can I find some research that backs this up? And this took a long time, but that's how I discovered Jeremy Jameson and Ali Kroom and Allison Wood Brooks and their studies back up what Seth is saying. But it's it's nice to have 
like the storyteller and communicator approach of Seth Godin and the science that backs it up, which makes this a really compelling topic. It's like we can explain this in a way that a fifth grader can understand it, but there's a lot of good science that uh, sort of like strengthens the argument as well. And that's what I'm always trying to find for any topic that we talk about. So with learning, does it matter how old we are? Can we still learn more as we are older and, and overcome these obstacles the same way as if we were younger? So yes, but not in the same way. So okay. um, one of the coolest interviews I, I, I did a few years ago was with this guy named Michael Merzenich. And probably most people listening haven't heard of him, but in the world of neuroscience, He's known as the father of neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity is this research that shows that actually anytime you learn something, our brains are physically changing a little bit during that process. So through action and practice, we're building up new pathways in our brain. And that's what a skill is. Skills aren't muscle memory. Skills are pathways that have been sort of fired and rewired over time. Then it feels more natural and it feels like muscle memory, but it's no, that's just an efficient pathway that you've fired and built up. And that's how learning works. And so I'm interviewing Merzenich and I talked to him for like 90 minutes, but the, the two statements that really like seared themselves into my brain, he goes, anyone at any age can change their brain. And he expanded on it. And the big point he's making is healthy brains remain plastic. There are some medical things that can get in the way, but a healthy brain remains plastic throughout our lives, which means regardless of our age, we do have the capacity to change, grow, and learn new skills. Now, we have to be accurate here, which is once you cross the age of like 18 to 24, it's not like a concrete line. You have to be more intentional with your action and learning to change the brain, but it can be done. So this is why yo, it's way easier to learn a language when you're two years old than when you're 50 years old, but you can, you absolutely can. So a healthy brain remains plastic. And then the other thing that he said um, that really stuck with me, he just like looks straight into the camera. And this, this guy's been studying the human brain since 1970. And he goes, absolutely everyone can get better at virtually anything, any skill. If it's a skill, you could get better at it. Not saying you're going to master it, not saying this happens overnight, but if it's a skill and most things are, you could get much better at it than you know. Dang. And that, if, we, if we're going to go zoom out and go full circle here, you ask me, what are things that get in the way of learning? So we talked about, I don't understand the value of struggle. We talked about fear and maybe the third biggest, most universal obstacle is oftentimes we just don't believe we can learn. We don't believe we could build that skill. And so this is a common term that a lot of us hear. It's that's called a fixed mindset. I am not a math person. I am not a leader. I could never learn to hit a curveball, whatever it may be. And those sort of fixed mindset beliefs oftentimes become true. And it's not magic. It's guess what? If I don't believe I can learn something, I probably won't practice it enough to actually build this skill. And so the question is like, well, how do you change those fixed mindset beliefs? And I, I truly believe that it's by talking about the brain. It's by talking about neuroplasticity. It's about having conversations about like what Michael Merzenich's research and many, many, many more people support, which is, yo, just because you're bad at something doesn't mean you can't learn it. And changing people's mindset around skills and learning, I think is one of the most important things we could do. So changing my mindset towards fear, changing my mindset towards skills and development, all these things are different tools that will help me spend more time taking action. And that's the pathway to getting good at something. Before I go down the growth mindset path, because I do want to dip into that because yeah. I think that's an extremely valuable piece. I want to talk a little bit more about the learning curve and the fact that we have this greater ability in our neuroplasticity when we're younger. Mm -hmm. But in my experience for me and for a lot of people I talk to, we don't enjoy learning as much until we're older. Mm -hmm. 
how do we help that flip so that we start to get some of these younger people to appreciate and enjoy the learning process from yeah. the time that they're capable of being great learners? Yeah. I don't know if I have a concrete answer, but all I can say is like, same. <laughs> I look at my time. I wish I could go back to school. It's like, what was I doing in college? It's like, oh, there are so many interesting classes that if I could run it back that I would take and so many interesting skills that I think would be useful now. So I think what happens is this. I think as we get older, we start to like find the things that interest us. And like you and I, like we, we fell into like a similar pathway. And now I start to see it's like, oh, well, what are things that could help me stay on this path? And so for me, it's like, okay, I want to be good at researching. I want to be really good at communicating. I want to be good at design. I want to be able to animate videos. I want to be good at podcast production. And so now because I have a need, it's like, I have like, yo, learning this thing. I see the direct like line of how this is going to help me in my life. Now I'm way more hungry to learn those things. When I was exposed to many of those things in college, but I didn't have a use case for the tool. And this kind of goes right back to like how we kicked off this conversation. And so I think there's some upside in helping people zoom out and see like the use case of a particular subject. So it's like, yo, math isn't just about learning an equation because the truth is you're probably never gonna use this equation in your life but a skill you're gonna use every day of your life is problem solving. And math is a place to get really good at problem solving because that's what it is. Here's a tool, here's a problem, figure it out. And that's a great skill to be good at. Uh, English isn't just about learning to like write poetry or understand the parts of language. It's like, guess what? Being a, like, okay, great example. I get a lot of emails like the one that you sent me inviting me to be on a podcast. Yours was like really well thought out well-written, convincing, simple. And it was an instant yes, because you are good at writing. And it's like getting good at that can open so many doors in our lives and helping students, younger, younger people understand that, like the value of the topic, I think is going to go a long way. Now, with all that being said, if someone came to me when I was in college and they're like, yo, this, 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 and this, I don't know if I would have been receptive to it, but it might've planted a seed where I would have looked at these subjects like in a different light. And so I always believe in zooming out, creating more purpose and understanding more of a why behind like, what is this thing and why do I need to get good at it? Um, I think that can go a long ways. So I'm gonna throw a hypothetical at you and I, I, I'm not sure if you've ever given it any thought or not, but if you were to build your own elementary school today, <laughs> How different would it look from the traditional go to school nine to five? Here's your subjects. Here's your stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> this is something I think about a lot. And I think it was Allie Kroom. Allie Kroom out of Stanford. She has this book called Wise Interventions. And I'm going to expand on her idea a bit, but I think it's important. So she's like, what is a wise intervention? is something that can actually be applied that benefits a lot of people. Um, and I can't, for, I can't remember the third, but I think you're going to see where I'm headed here. So she's like, there's so many things in research that it's like, oh, this would make a difference. Maybe it's like, guess what? Students in school would crush it if they could nap in a hyperbaric chamber after recess for an hour and the teacher to student ratio was one to one. Cool. Guess what? can't do those things. So that's not a wise intervention. It's like, yes, this thing could lead to like create benefits, but it can't be applied. So it is not a wise intervention. And so, okay, let's go back to your question. It's like, okay. And maybe the dream scenario, you could come up with all sorts of things, but if you were actually looking for wise interventions of like, what are things that can be done? I think I would spend quite a bit of time on the mindset piece. I would spend a lot of time on the learning piece as well. It's like, hey, our goal with this school is we want you to be really, really, really good at learning. And learning in and of itself is a skill. 
So every subject, every assignment is an opportunity to not only learn this skill we're working on, but it's another rep to become a better learner. And so just kind of framing up this bigger mission of like, look, the things that we're going to teach you in this school, you're probably not going to use later because the world is changing. It's like, guess what? I haven't wrote cursive since fourth grade. <laughs> so it's like, and that's true for a lot of the subjects, but the skill you're going to use every single day of your life, it doesn't matter what you do. A skill that's going to benefit you every day of your life, if you're good at it, is learning. And that's what we're about here. And so having conversations like that, I think would be a big staple of my like dream school. Um, and then creating an environment where students feel safe to struggle and make mistakes. Like that's huge. And so that that's kind of getting in to a different topic called psychological safety that we talk about quite a bit, but it's like, yeah, you can tell people all day the importance of struggle, the importance of mistakes and the importance of getting out of their comfort zone. But if you're not creating a healthy environment where I feel like I can do that, I'm probably not going to do it. And so, yeah, you attack behavior change from the mindset perspective, but you need to build an environment that supports it as well. And that one, two punch is what we're chasing. And that's what I would chase in the school. I like that. I like that. And I love that you mentioned cursive because I purposely <laughs> write in cursive in my journal because it's a nice. skill that I developed. And I was like, you know what? I don't want it to go away and <laughs> nobody else knows it. And then if anybody grabs it, they probably can't read my writing anyway. There so, you go. <laughs> um, Let's dig into the uh, the growth mindset piece now, because I think that's a very valuable, mm -hmm. another valuable skill that we find getting as we move through life. People are trapped in this thought that I can't do that or I yep. can't do this. And that's the first thing they go to. Mm -hmm. What's the most common thing you see between the person who has a fixed mindset, the difference between that person and the person who has a growth mindset? So a couple things. One is we're all kind of a mix of the two. So like it's messier than just like, I am a growth mindset person. I am a fixed. It's like, and it might not even be worth getting into the weeds, but whatever, let's do it. <laughs> so like I'm doing a workshop with a major league baseball team. And one of the players has a strong growth mindset towards hitting a fastball. It's like, yeah. I'm really good at it. I've practiced this skill a bunch. I'm good. I've, I've earned this skill. I cannot hit a curve and I cannot learn that skill. Okay. That's a growth and fixed mindset towards the same freaking skill. <laughs> like the skill is hitting a baseball, but that player ha displays a growth mindset. I believe I can get better at hitting a fastball. It, I'm good at it and I can get better. And I believe I cannot get better at hitting a curve. And so like, that's a mix right there. Yeah. And so what we're after is just helping people understand what is the difference. And this is where some people go off track at its core. Dwex research is about our belief in our capacity to change and grow and build a skill. So a growth mindset is I believe I can build skills. I believe I can grow and change. Now this can work in the big way or small. It's like, I believe I could hit the fastball or learn to hit a fastball. A fixed mindset is the belief that I'm stuck. I can't change. I can't grow. Now those definitions are simple. Then the question is like, Dweck's research shows that our mindsets in, influence our capacity to grow. If I'm operating in a growth mindset, I tend to learn better than if I'm operating in a fixed. And I think it's common sense here, not common sense, but logical. And let's just bring it back to exercise. If I don't believe I can get in better shape, I'm probably not going to exercise very much because what's the point? If I don't believe I can change my body, if I don't believe I could get in better shape, probably not going to spend much time exercising. And if I spend minimal amount of time exercising, exercising, am I going to get much stronger? No. Then you flip it and say, if I believe I can get in better shape, I'm more likely to exercise. And I see that progress. And you see how that kind of confirms my original belief. I was, I was like, yeah, I was right. I can grow. But then on the fixed side, I kind of confirm my fixed mindset belief. So I believe I'm not a math person because my parents tell me that or someone tells me that and I adopt this belief 
that belief is robbing me of action and practice and engagement over time. And then it becomes true. And that confirms the belief. And so these are two like self-fulfilling cycles. And the goal is it's like, yo, I want to get into this growth mindset side because it's like, that can lead to positive momentum in the right direction that every time I learn, that's another notch on the belt. It's like, yep, I'm a learner. I can grow. I can change. And so all this action is leading to growth and the growth is evidence that supports my mindset. But then the same is true on the fixed mindset side. When I don't change, when I don't grow, that's evidence supporting my fixed mindset. And so it's important to kind of lay it out like that and talk about not just what the mindsets are, but how they affect our actions. And it's dead simple. A growth mindset can fuel actions. A fixed mindset can rob us of actions. And this just that's just how it works in big and small ways all around us. Which brings us to like, maybe the most important part is like, how do you build a growth mindset? Like, how do you do that? You don't just tell someone to have a growth mindset. And then that's where you bring in conversations around neuroplasticity. So you see how like, we're always, I'm always trying to avoid the, the easy trap to fall into is telling someone to do something learn more, have a growth mindset, be fearless, whatever. It's like, no, I'm trying to go from the ground up and I'm trying to build this growth mindset organically. And you do that by having conversations about the brain, about neuroplasticity. So as a, as a teacher, leader, coach, educator, how important is our language when it comes to either enforcing a fixed mindset or developing and encouraging a growth mindset? It's really important. And there's no need to overcomplicate this. It's my number one recommendation for anyone in any sort of leadership role is just talk about things as skills. So the difference between me saying you are not born to be a leader versus, yo, you know, and I know that leadership isn't your strongest skill but skills can be built and developed over time. And it's going to take some practice and some struggle and some experimentation, but I'm here to help. That's the same kind of like intent. I'm basically saying you're not very good at this thing, but one is saying you weren't born with it. And the other is saying, yeah, of course, this isn't your strongest skill, but it's a skill and skills can be built. And so that signal that I'm sending to like the audience or, or that particular person is so important. And that you nailed it. It's like our language plays a huge role in enforcing or reinforcing a growth mindset or creating fixed mindset stories. So you're not a math person. You're not a leader. You're not born to, to be good at this. Like th those are sending these signals that, yeah, you just don't have this skill. You can't change it. So talk about things as skills and then frame it from this idea that skills are something that can be built and developed over time. Yeah. I like that. It's a, it's more like, instead of saying you're not this, you haven't gotten enough reps yet to be that. Yep. Yep. hundred percent, hundred percent. And we're not saying everyone has to learn everything. We're not saying that. And we're not saying everyone's going to master everything either. But if they, if, if it's a skill and most things are, and they want to get better at it and they spend time practicing it, they can absolutely get better at it. Like that's all we're saying. And so like, I guarantee there's all sorts of skills that you and I could build. that are not, not relevant to our lives, but there is a lifetime of skills that are very relevant to our lives that if you and I spent a little bit of extra time practicing them, they would benefit us. And that's true for every single person listening. It doesn't matter what lane you're on. It doesn't matter what you do. There's all sorts of skills within our grasp that would help us be better at what we do. And my goal basically with in life is to help people understand that and start grabbing these skills. And it like everything I do, everything I talk about is just helping people do that. As we wrap up here, I've got another thing I want to dig into a little bit. And while we're on the topic of language and how we talk and communicate and lead, I want to go into the Pygmalion effect a little bit. Can you explain that to my listeners, cool. kind of what that is? Awesome. So there's some controversy around this, but if you get to the core of what the research is saying, I think it's another thing that you just see all around us. So there's this guy named Robert Rosenthal. 
And when I interviewed him, he was like 89 years old and he was still a professor and still doing research at UC Riverside. So he's like a beast. And he spent the majority of his career researching the Pygmalion effect. And I fly to California, I spend the day with him and I'll just take you through how he explained it to me. And then we'll give some, some takeaways. So I'm like, okay, what is this? How did you discover it? And he goes, the first study we did was in 1958 with rats. And he has this lab, they run experiments with rats. All of these rats are in cages. And one night he sneaks into the lab on half of the cages, he puts a sign that says smart rat. On the other half of the cages, he puts a sign that says dumb rat. <laughs> so it's like, they're all the same rats. Half got labeled smart, half got labeled dumb. A group of students comes in and they have to take care of the rats for like a week. And they feed them and handle them in and out of the cage, care for the rats. At the end of the week, they run the rats through a maze. The smart rats run through the maze better and faster than the dumb rats. Okay, that's weird. Like, <laughs> obviously, the rats couldn't read. So, this isn't about like their confidence and their mindset. But the students in the study could read. So, the core of the Pygmalion effect is our labels and expectations can become true because we make them become true. So, when they looked at the data, the smart rats did run through the maze better than the dumb rats. So they actually became smarter. The students didn't manipulate the data. But when they looked at what happened under the hood, it's, oh, the students treated the smart rats better. They handled them with more care in and out of the cage. They'd even feed them a little bit more. So it was the extra support and extra food that helped them run through the maze faster. So the label on the cage becomes true because it changes how the students treat the rat. And then that changes the outcome. And then he explained like, look, there's been 500 variations of this study. They've looked in the military and school and the sports world. And time and time again, they see this effect at play. It's like, as a leader, my expectations of someone can become true because it changes how I treat them. Now, sort of the, the controversy here is you're going to see more of a Pygmalion effect when it's about the expectations of someone who actually controls the opportunities and reps. Like if I have no control over your experiences, it doesn't matter what I think about you. But if I am in a role where I do control the opportunities and experiences of people, I'm going to see more of this effect at play. And so again, once you understand what it is, you see it everywhere. So uh, like I come from the basketball world. A common one here is like, oh, tall people can't dribble. And if you look around, you're like, yeah, most tall people aren't very good at ball handling. Well, why is that? It's not because there's some law of physics that's like, yo, if you're over 6'4", you can't move your arm like this. <laughs> because the proof against that is like, look in the NBA, they're seven feet and they have great handles. Most tall people can't dribble because they're not given the opportunity to practice. Because if you rewind back to seventh grade, most coaches say, well, if you're tall, go stand by the hoop. And they're not really given opportunities to practice. And of course, they're not going to build the skill if they're never given opportunities to practice. But here is the, I think, the nasty part of the Pygmalion effect. The label and expectation becomes true. And then I feel like I'm right. So my label or my expectation is like, yeah, tall people can't dribble. If I'm a basketball coach, I never allow them to practice. And then they get the ball in the game and dribble it off their foot. I was like, yeah, tall people can't dribble. I was right. It's like, ah, but we need, what we need to understand is I'm kind of making that label become true because I've limited their practice. Now I'm not saying like the tallest seventh grader on your basketball team is going to become your point guard over the course of even a season. But what I am saying is, if you go back to what Michael Merzenich said, is we can all get better at stuff. And so like all every player on my basketball team can get better at shooting. Some are better than others, but we could all get better at shooting. Every player on my basketball team can get better at ball handling if I'm allowed to practice. And so I guess the takeaway with the Pygmalion effect, and I'm so happy you asked it because I don't get to talk about that enough, which is 
okay, we know what it is, but how do we use it? And I think it funnels back to this idea of learner. It's like, as a leader, look at the people around that you lead as learners and treat them accordingly. This isn't saying they're all the best at everything. Of course not. But everyone around me can get better if they practice. And so that word, if you connect that back to the feedback and, and language piece, the word learner holds me accountable. So if I'm a leader and I believe you're a learner, I can't put you in a box and say, you could never learn to dribble. You're not a leader. You're not born to be good at math. I can't say that anymore. What I can say is the conversation we had two minutes ago, which is, hey, I know and you know ball handling isn't your strongest skill. You haven't practiced it very much. But my goal is to give you more reps and opportunities to practice that skill. It's going to be messy, but the more you do it, the better you're going to get. You're going to be more comfortable doing and executing this skill. And it's like, wow, that's absolutely right. And like that made me a better leader by just understanding that my people have the capacity to grow. And so that's where growth mindset and Pygmalion effect overlap, which is as an individual, I really want my people to believe in their capacity to grow. And then the leadership application is as leaders, we need to believe in our people's capacity to grow as well. And it's like, same idea. So to follow up on that, do you think that the labels that we're creating in schools that are designed to leave no kid left behind are actually creating more of this Pygmalion effect over the course of a student's career? Or is it something that in that instance, because of the, they might have a learning disability or something like that, it doesn't play as big a role? I think, and I'm not quite sure of the specific language that's used in like the different programs and, and the systems, but what I would just be really aware of is any label that's going to limit opportunities. And like, those are the ones we have to be careful of. So, okay. I was doing, uh, I presented about the Pygmalion effect to a division one football team. And they're like, this is cool, but we have all sorts of labels. Like we have positions and strengths and weaknesses. Are we supposed to get rid of all of them? No, <laughs> just attach learner on top. It's like, Hey, my left guard has great range and great footwork, but can't pass block. Okay. That's great. That's strengths and weaknesses. My left guard can improve their range and get better at pass blocking because my left guard is a learner. So I, I keep the label of the position. I keep the strengths and weaknesses and I'm attaching learner on top. And so then you could use the same logic when it comes to education, which is like, we have all sorts of labels that we use. If we attach learner on top, it's probably going to be a, a useful strategy. I like that idea. I think that's a fantastic way of approaching it. And it opens the door for people to not fall back on the excuse of I'm not this or I'm not that and yeah. hold each other more accountable to continue to grow and learn and become better over time. Yeah. So. As, uh, as we wrap up here, what I want to do now is give my audience a chance to connect with you more. Where can they follow your work? Where can they jump in if they want to get in on a workshop, something like that? And I can put that in the show yeah. notes. So if you just go to thelearnerlab.com, that's my website. And I really like our, our podcast is, is good. We interview quite a few of the scientists. Um, the videos we make are cool. Try to, I'm trying to write more as well. And I just published my audio book. And that's free. If you click around on the website, you'll, you'll find the link to that. And I'm really proud of how that turned out, which is, hey, here's everything I've ever learned put together in a book. And because it's an audio format, we, you get to hear from Merzenich. You get to hear from the scientists. You get to hear from Jeremy Jameson. And I just, I love how that turned out. And so um, anybody can access that for free as well on the website. Awesome. I'll make sure I get that all in the show notes, get some people over there to check that out. Cause uh, cool. I think we all need to be better learners and that's something that we can live with for the rest of our lives and carry that legacy forward. So Trevor, awesome. thank you so much for taking time with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, thank you for doing what you do. I appreciate it. And if there's anything you need, just let me know. Awesome. As always guys, keep reaching for the stars, fall flat on your face, but remember whenever we fall, always get up. Thank you for joining us today on the Edge of Greatness podcast. If you haven't yet, please take a minute now to subscribe and review our show. Join us again next week as we continue to dig deeper into the key components of greatness. The path to greatness is never linear, so remember to keep pursuing greatness no matter what. 
keep stretching your abilities, reach for the stars, and fall flat on your face. But remember, no matter what happens, whenever we fall, always get up. Until next time, I'm Charles Schultz, and this was the Edge of Greatness Podcast.